Hello and welcome to Nithranya YouTube channel. You're watching another episode of the Game in a Nutshell series designed for explaining the board game rules. My name is Branislav Verec and in this video we're going to learn how to play Coalitions, which is a game designed by Andrew Rourke and published by Phalanx Studio, which is going to Kickstarter on June 16th. So everything you're about to see in this video is the prototype version of the game. All the components are prototype, the rules are still in development and the game will come with some cardboard coins and maybe even with some metal coins. In the meantime, I'm using my own metal coins, some generic metal coins from my collection. So let's get started. First, players need to decide which nation or nations they will control in the game. In a six player game, each player will control one nation, in the lower player counts, the exact distribution is listed in the rulebook. For example, for a three-player game, one player will control Britain, Russia and Austria, the second player will control France and the third player will control Ottoman and Prussia. Based on the given scenario, set the initial morale for each nation. Starting influence, which in this scenario is 17 for all nations, and also the political status of each nation. Russian and Austrian start as the allies of Britain, Prussia starts the game as the neutral nation, and Ottomans are waging a war of expansion, which means they are in war against everyone. Place all the generals and all the units and garrisons as indicated in the scenario. Shuffle the deck of battle cards and again, as determined by the scenario, distribute the given number of cards to each nation, not to the players, to the nations. And place the deck of remaining battle cards somewhere next to the game board. In a two-player game and in a solo game, also prepare this Napoleon's deck, which is a deck of cards that determines the movement of Napoleon's army. And finally, place this rondel next to the game board. It will be a central mechanism that determines the action for each nation. In coalitions, players are trying to gain influence with their nations. Influence is this number in these disputed territories, the territories with these stripes. And to control such territories, you have to move there with your general and your units and garrison your units in those territories. The game is played in rounds, and in each round, each nation performs the action associated with their section of this rondel. You can either play these actions one by one, starting with the first one, then second, third, and so on, or all nations can actually perform all those actions simultaneously, because the only action which changes the status on the game board is this movement action, and it's the last action in the order of those actions. I will describe all these actions in more detail, but in a nutshell, nations will recruit units, move and battle with their units and gain new territories, they will get income from their territories, they will get influence, and then there are these two supporting actions. Since this small disc will be rotating each round, each nation will perform a different action each round. Once this symbol comes back to the starting position, Players will perform the diplomacy phase, in which players may join or break coalitions, they may become neutral or start their own war against everyone. The game ends if any nation reaches or exceeds 40 influence points, or if Paris is controlled by any other nation than France. In either case, the game is won by the player who controls the nation with the highest number of influence points. In the political phase, players will have a few minutes to discuss and negotiate potential changes of the political status of their nations. However, that only applies to Russia, Austria, Prussia and Ottomans, because Britain and France are always against each other. So they can never change their political status. The remaining four nations have four options, either to be in the coalition with Britain, or in the coalition with France, or to be neutral or in the war against everyone. If any nation wants to join the coalition of France or Britain, that country must give the permission to that nation. Furthermore, if one player controls more than one nation, that player may not have 
nations in different coalitions. He may have a nation in a coalition with one country and the other may be neutral, but never in both coalitions at the same time. Then if the nation wants to leave the coalition, permission is not required. If the nation is in this war of aggression status, it is at war against all other nations. And finally, neutral nations may not contest territories, however, their income in the round will be doubled. The first action on the rondel is this battle card exchange. That means that the nation may draw one card from the deck of battle cards, and then it must discard one card from the hand to the discard pile. If the draw deck ever runs out, reshuffle all the discarded cards and create a new draw deck. Each nation has a limit of six cards in hand, except for France, which as the only nation may hold up to 10 cards. If you have more than that, you must discard the excess cards immediately. The second action is taxation and the active nation will gain income. Income is this white number above the region name and you gain income from all your home territories, so the territories of the same color as your nation, in Ottoman case those are these yellow regions, unless the region is garrisoned by any other nation. And you also gain income from all other regions where you have the garrison, so not just your general, you must have a garrison there. These striped territories don't provide income, you can gain influence there. So sum up the numbers from all your home territories not controlled by other nations and add the income from territories you control and that's the income that goes to that nation's treasury. Now Britain as the only nation in the game can also gain income from trade. Every territory with the sport symbol, which is free, which means there is no garrison token in that territory, generates one income for Britain. So in this picture it would be one, two, three, four coins for Britain. The third action is called the leadership action and with this action, first and foremost, you can redeploy any generals you have off the map back onto the battlefield. You can place them in any territory you control, so it could be your home territory if it's not controlled by other nations, or in any other territory you control, and again, to control the territory you must have a garrison there. Having just a general in the territory doesn't make you control that territory. If you wouldn't have any generals off the map, you can instead gain one morale or one battle card. If Britain is taking this action, in addition to those three basic options, it can also provide subsidies to its allies. Britain must use the money from their own treasury and they can distribute any amount of money to any nation or all nations with which Britain is in coalition. Now, for this subsidy, Britain will gain one influence. If you're in a co-op variant or in a solo game and you play with these Napoleon cards, when France takes this action, this symbol indicates that you also have to move Napoleon into the depicted regions. You will move a general with three army units into every region depicted. The fourth action is the mobilization action. Nation will use its own treasury money to buy more units, morale and battle cards. For each unit, for each point of morale and for each card, it will have to pay one coin. When you raise the morale, simply move the marker on the morale track. You may never increase the morale above 15. When recruiting units, you may only place them under a general of your nation, but there is a limit of maximum three units per general. When you buy the battle cards, place them into that nation's hand. Now, any unspent money at the end of this action is lost. The only exception is Britain, which may keep any unspent money. Then the next action is gaining influence. Influence is this black number in a circle in these so-called disputed territories, these striped territories, and the colors of these stripes indicate which nation can gain influence from that territory. 
In this example, it can only be Ottomans and Russians. This Warsaw territory can be disputed by French, Austrians, Russians and Prussians. To gain influence from the territory, you must have a garrison there, you must control that territory. That means that in this Dalmatia region, where Ottomans decided not to leave the garrison unit, they would not gain this influence. You can also gain influence if you control a home territory of another nation. In that case, the influence you gain is this mobilization number of the region. On the other hand, if you would control a region which may not be disputed by your nation, instead of this influence, you gain income immediately. So sum up all the influence you gain from the disputed regions or from home regions of other territories if you control them and move the marker of that nation on the influence track. Don't forget that when the nation is neutral, it gains no influence at all. However, the income was doubled earlier. The last action is the movement action. In a given round, the nation can move and battle up to three times. However, that movement must be first enabled by one other nation, which is an element of abstract diplomacy. So the active nation, French in this example, must choose one other nation to enable the movement and gain morale as a benefit. Now, the enabling nation must not be the nation controlled by the same player then it may not be the nation which is in the same coalition as the active nation. And it may not be the nation which would exceed 15 points of morale. So let's say the active nation, the French nation, would choose Russia as the enabler. You can take one unused token of the enabling nation and place it in this enabling box as the reminder. Now, one permission to move and battle is a must. Then after the active nation finishes the movement and potential battles, the enabling nation may decide to give another permission for the active nation. Then at the end of the second round of movement and battles, the enabling nation may also decide to give the third permission for the third round of movement and battles. On the other hand, the active nation may decide not to request another permission if it doesn't wish to move and battle for the second or the third time. As a benefit for the enabling nation, that nation will receive one point of morale for enabling the first round of movement, additional two points of morale for the second round of movement, and potentially additional three more morale points for enabling the third round of movements and battles. So that would be one, two additional and three additional points. If the next permission would increase the morale of the enabling nation above 15, such permission may not be granted. During each movement round, each general, together with their units, may perform one movement. That is moving from one region to an adjacent region, or moving up to three regions, but those regions must be either controlled by the active nation or by their allies, and in that case the ally must give permission. You may never move through this brown impassable terrains, in this case it's Alps. These sea lanes can only be used by Britain or British allies if Britain gives permission to that, and during one movement you can move up to three times through these sea lanes. Two generals of the same nation may not end their movement in the same territory. However, you can move one of the generals first and move the second one into the vacated territory. Two or more generals from different nations but from one coalition may remain in the same territory. If the general enters the territory with an enemy general, there will be a battle which I'm going to explain in a minute. All the unit tokens that are underneath a general are called units, and these units, which don't have any general on top of them, are garrisons. Garrison units are a very important part of the game because they're the only way how you can control a territory. You can leave a garrison in place as part of the movement, or even if you stay in the same territory, or you can do both, you can leave a garrison in your current territory, then move the general to the new territory and leave the garrison there as well. You may never leave a garrison in a territory of another nation 
If you control both nations, you may still move into the territory, but not leave a garrison. Each territory may contain maximum one garrison, and you may voluntarily decide to disband the garrison, in that case the unit is simply discarded. Neutral nations, like Prussia in our example, may only move to their home territories or territories they control. They may not move to contested territories or to a home territories of another nation. Other non-neutral nations may enter the home territory of the neutral nation, but they may not leave a garrison there. If you enter a territory which contains a general or a garrison from the nation which is not in the same coalition, a battle will occur. Now proceed with the following sequence. First, calculate the base strength of both the attacker and the defender. Each general, each unit and also each garrison counts as one point of strength. You can use this track at the bottom of the map to show the current strength of both the attacker and the defender. Here we have one French general and two unit tokens, that's the base strength of three, and one Austrian general plus three unit tokens and plus one garrison. In the second step, you may request support from the adjacent territories. The attacker starts first and then is followed by the defender. In our example, French and Prussia are in the same coalition and Austria and Ottomans are in the same coalition. So, you can request the support from your own army, your own generals and units from adjacent regions, not from the garrisons. Garrison may never support the battle in the adjacent region. And you may also request support from your coalition partner. The same applies for the defender. They may request support from their own units or from their coalition partners. Obviously, neutral armies can never give any support. British generals may also request support from territories linked via a sea lane. If the coalition partner agrees to provide support, again for each general and each unit, at one point of strength. However, each unit may only take part in one battle, so this Austrian unit must decide whether it provides support to this general or it will fight the battle against this French general. The same applies for this Ottoman unit. If they provide support, they can only support one or the other battle, not both. Then in the third step, all nations involved in a battle may play their battle cards. The attacking nation starts first and may play a battle card. Then they are followed by all the supporting nations. Then the defender may play a battle card. And then each nation that supports the defender may also play a battle card. And the turn order comes back to the attacker and players continue like this until all nations pass. For each general, unit and the garrison of the nation involved in a battle, that nation may play one card. That also includes all the supporting units and generals from adjacent regions if they are from the same nation. And also for the supporting nations. So if Ottomans would decide to use both generals to support this Austrian army, both generals have one unit token in their territory, so the Ottoman player may play four battle cards in total. When all nations pass, it's time for the fourth step of the battle, and that's revealing all these battle cards and adding the total value of the cards played to the strength of the army of that nation. So in our example, the total value of all these cards would be added to the strength of the attacker and the total value of these cards will be added to the strength of the defender. However, for each card that nation played during the battle, reduce the morale by one point. So for five cards played, you have to reduce the morale by five points. Then the coalition with the higher strength wins the battle. Then discard all the battle cards played and each nation that has at least one general involved in the battle will draw one new card from the deck into that nation's hand of cards. Then in the fifth step resolve the outcome of the battle. Let's say we have the France and the Prussia winning the battle. 
then all the generals and the garrisons of the winning side may stay in the territory, but each general of the winning nation and also each general of the supporting nations will lose one unit. That also applies to the generals from the winning nation supporting the general in the territory. Then the winning nation and the supporting nations each gain one influence. If the French army would be defeated by nations from the British coalition, those nations would gain one additional point of influence. So if Austria would be in a British coalition and they would beat France, they would gain one plus one influence point. Now resolve all the losing nations and losing generals. All the generals in the territory that lost the battle will lose all their units and all the garrisons. And the losing general has to return back to the capital of their home territory. However, if that capital is occupied, the general is placed off the map. Then all the supporting generals lose one unit. Losing side doesn't lose any influence for losing the battle. As I already said, when this small circle comes back to this starting position, so when these two symbols match, you have to perform the political phase. Again, players may decide to change their political status. However, to do that, you have to control your capital. If you don't, thematically, the nation is defeated and must sign a peace treaty, which means that nation must become neutral. Now, when your nation becomes neutral, either because it is forced or by your own choice, if you have any garrisons in other nations' territory, those are returned as units to the nearest general that still has a capacity. This one already has three units, so this unit comes back to this general. But also the garrisons of other nations in your territory become units again and are moved to the nearest general. Your garrisons in contested territories remain in place. Then, if you change the political status of your nation, and you have a general in the territory with another general that used to be in the same coalition with you, but now is not. During the next movement phase, there are four options. You may move to any adjacent territory which is empty or with your garrison, or potentially with the general of your new coalition, or you may remain in place and battle. If you have the garrison in the same territory as another general, then there is no other choice but battle, because the garrisons may not move. And finally, if the other general is now neutral, you may remain in the same territory without any consequences. Now, if those two generals are not in the same coalition and they're not neutral, but before resolving the new change in the political status, it may happen that another general of another coalition enters the territory. That obviously triggers the battle, and if this new general is in the same coalition as another general in the territory, they fight together against the other general. But if they're all fighting against each other, the new general battles one of the generals first, and then, if it's victorious, fights another general in the second battle immediately. The game can end in two different ways. First, if any nation reaches or exceeds 40 influence points. And second, if Paris is controlled by any other player than French. If that happens, before you look at the influence points and determine the winner, if you have a general in Paris and you are in the British coalition, add three influence points to your score. And if your general is not from the British coalition, add 6 influence points to your score. If you would exceed 40 influence points, you can continue adding influence points again from zero. Then the winner is the nation with the highest number of influence points and obviously the player who controls that nation. Other nations from the same coalition are also considered to be co-winners, but somewhat less influential winners. So that's how you play coalitions. If you have any questions or comments, I'll do my best to answer as many as I can. If you like the series, please subscribe. You can even support the channel on the Patreon page. You've been watching Game in a Nutshell. My name is Branislav Berec and hope to see you next time.